Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 26 through 40. Then the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian Enoch, a court official of the Canaanites, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shear, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The Enoch asked Philip, And whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip began to speak. Starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him such good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And Enoch said, Look, here is water. What is it to prevent me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the Enoch, went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The Enoch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was preparing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns he came to in Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Good morning, Grace Church. Thank you for this invitation to your pulpit this morning. It is great to be with you all. I so wish we could be in person this morning, but we just have to trust that the Lord will make this cyberspace a sacred space and that we are together in spirit. So let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day and for the opportunity to gather around your word. Thank you that your word is life-giving, and we ask that we might receive all that you have for us today in your holy scripture. Amen. Friends, our passage this morning from Acts 8 tells us that God values our questions, that God considers our questions a very good thing, things that he can use to further us along in the life of faith. Those questions that on, are on our mind and on our hearts are things that God welcomes because he can do so much for us as we ask and as we await the answers. I know that some of us may need encouragement this morning to ask those questions of God that we have on our heart. We may think that they will seem, make us seem ungrateful if we ask them. We may think that they may make us seem like we doubt God or like we weren't paying attention at some point. But no, God knows that our questions come from genuine seeking in fact, Jesus himself tells us to ask, to seek, to knock, because those questions are a sign that we are actually looking for more of God in our life and the assurance that God is really in this with us. And of course, God is. Let's think about for a moment all the times in the Gospels that Jesus was approached by people with questions, not idle questions, not show off kinds of questions, but serious questions that came from the heart. 
think of the people who were ill and came to Jesus asking him if he would heal them. And he did. We think of the people who came and asked more theological questions, like the young nobleman who came and asked Jesus what he had to do to inherit eternal life. This mattered deeply to him. And Jesus gave him a direct answer. He did not ignore the question or why the young man was asking it. And of course, there was the time when the disciples were wondering if Jesus even cared about them. They were in a boat on the Sea of Galilee and a storm had come up and they were fighting the storm while he was asleep. And they shook him awake and said, don't you care that we are perishing? And of course, Jesus cares. And so he calmed the sea and he chastised the disciples for their little faith. But he never ignored or dismissed the question, nor should we when we become aware of a question that is forming in our hearts. And so this morning, I don't know what kind of question you are asking of the Lord or want to ask of the Lord, but it could be everything from a trial we are going through that ask for help, a trial a loved one is going through and wondering how you can help. Some of us carry the burdens of our society. We're asking the bigger questions about the violence and the oppression and the injustice that is all around us. When will we see an end to these things? When will we learn how to get along on this planet? Friends, the questions that come are welcome by God. And in fact, the questions that come from the hard places hold a special place, I believe, in God's heart. And so often our questions do come from the hard places, from those seasons of wilderness in our lives. And so that brings us to our text this morning, where we find ourselves, we are told, on a wilderness road, some road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And on that road, as we heard, there is an encounter of an Ethiopian official who is on his way home through that stretch, and Philip, one of the apostles. It was probably a desert place, a place where there might not have even been officially a road, but nonetheless, this Ethiopian official is on this road, and he's on such a road also spiritually, and we are told why. We know that he is, as the scripture says, an important person in the court of Kandaki, the queen of Ethiopia. He is director of the treasury, which is a position of great prestige and responsibility. And so he enjoys the good things in life. He has status and he is in a chariot, which would be like a Cadillac today or a Lexus. And he is reading a scripture long before the days of a pocket Bible or something on your handheld device. He has his own copy of the prophets and he is reading them as he travels back home. And it is yet for him a wilderness road because we are told he is also a eunuch. Now bear with me because this is uncomfortable subject matter, but in the ancient world, occasionally men were castrated or would castrate themselves and become eunuchs because that qualified them for high positions, positions of responsibility. For example, they were used to guard harems um, and also, apparently, there was a place for him in this court of the Queen of Ethiopia. And so, while he had this very high, highly thought of, highly regarded position of responsibility with the finances in the court, he also knew what it meant to be an outcast, to be lonely, because in his sexual state, he would not have a family, and he would not really belong to any community because he would be considered different. 
And in fact, we know that at that time in Jerusalem, that eunuchs and foreigners and some others were in fact excluded from the congregation because of their sexual status. And being that way, he would have been perhaps drawn to the Jewish faith, but not allowed to enter all the way because um, he was not considered a complete man. And for that, he suffered. And so we have this man traveling on a wilderness road in more than one way, because in his spirit, he has known the loneliness and the rejection of his fellow human beings. So it is at this moment, though, in this hard place that God does not leave him. He has a question forming in his heart as he is reading the scripture, the Isaiah passage that we heard this morning, and it goes like this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. And this question that he is asking of God in his heart, that he is about to speak verbally, was so important that God sends Philip out of the blue to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to this wilderness place to be there and meet the eunuch and talk with him when this question comes forth. And so as we heard, Philip is there as the chariot is going along. And in those days, people read out loud. So he's hearing these words of Isaiah being read. And he goes to this official and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, well, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And then Philip gets into the chariot with him and a conversation ensues. And perhaps because it was a private space, the eunuch feels free to ask Philip the question that really matters to him, which is, is the prophet talking about himself or is he talking about another? This person who understood what it meant to stand silent before his shearer and to be humiliated. And Philip doesn't miss a beat. He answers the question saying, yes, this God that you have been reading about, this God that Isaiah is pointing to is one who understands you, is one who has been through what you have been through, is one that you can relate to and trust. And that was the question on the eunuch's heart that day. So much was at stake in the answer to that question. It reminds me of a time not that long ago when uh, I was speaking with a man who made his living as a Mason and he was going through a hard time and I was sharing a little bit of my faith with him where I draw my strength and my hope. And I came to a sentence where I mentioned the word Jesus. And he said, oh, Jesus, he was a carpenter, right? And I know that when he was asking me if he was a carpenter, he wasn't doing a fact check. He wasn't trying to sound smart. What he was really asking was, is this Jesus somebody that I could relate to and could relate to me, both of us being trades people? And I knew that when I said, Yes, he was a carpenter. There was so much hope and healing in that answer for this man who so much wanted to know that God was in this life with him, that God was aware, that God understood, and that God was approachable. And so this treasury official is in this hard place and asks this question, and finds revelation and hope and life in the answer that Philip gives him. How much joy must have filled his heart. And in fact, he's aware that the barriers have just been torn down, 
the barriers to community, the barriers to unity with God, the barriers to enjoying life have all been taken down with that one question answered. And so for the first time in his life, he feels welcomed into the family of faith. And he says, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip baptizes him. And the water that they used must have also appeared rather miraculously, it being a desert place. In the conversation that Philip had with the eunuch, we can't help but wonder if he scrolled a little bit ahead in that scroll to Isaiah 56, where it says, where Isaiah foretells that there's going to come a day that the Messiah will bring on a day when all are welcome in the assembly, that even eunuchs will be allowed into worship and that they too will have a legacy, even without children, their virtues and the blessing of their life will be passed on to future generations. What an incredible revelation for that Ethiopian official who went on his way rejoicing. And so we can be so thankful this morning for this example of a question seen as holy by God and resulting in a holy moment right there on the wilderness road. And let's also be thankful for Philip, whom, as we heard, dropped everything when he heard the Spirit's call. And he went to an unknown place with an unknown assignment, and yet he was available to this man who was asking a heartfelt question. We noticed that Philip was so respectful and compassionate in the way he answered that question. It might not have been his question, but he understood it was this new friend's important question to God. And he walked the walk with him in that brief stretch until he had his answer. And how thankful we can be for those people in our life who have respectfully and compassionately heard our questions for God and been with us, waiting patiently for the answer, supporting us, praying for us for that answer. And how blessed we are when we have someone who will take our questions seriously and not dismiss them or not try to change them, but just understand us that that's where we are in our faith and we need a friend to come alongside us while we wait for the answers. When we have questions for God, it sometimes takes some waiting to hear the answer. But it is in that time that God helps us grow because we may have to strain to hear what the Spirit is saying. We may have to open ourselves to a new view of ourselves to change to all the ways that God expands our life and draws us closer. These are holy moments to God and it takes our holiest self to respond in a way that will bless us and bless others as we receive the responses to our questions. And I want us to remember that there is no question that is inappropriate to ask the Lord. Some of us, as I said earlier, have big questions, and some of us have smaller questions. But there is no question that God can't handle, that God does not receive tenderly. And remember, we're asking the God of the universe our questions. The God of the universe can handle questions about racism, about our environment, and so forth. Remember the story in the scriptures when Jesus was teaching the crowds and they had accumulated over the course of the day until there were multitudes listening to him and none of them had had anything to eat all day. The disciples noticed this. 
And so as the day came to an end, they said to Jesus, how are we going to feed all these people? And they were ready to pack it in and send everybody home so that they would not be too hungry. And so their motive was good, but Jesus had a way that the disciples could never have figured out. And the story is famous now, the answer is famous. Jesus took one small lunch a boy had brought and blessed it and all were fed. And so friends, that question, how are we going to feed all these people is a question to which God may have a way that we don't see until we pray in trust. And how wonderful it is when we pray together as a community, supporting one another in these big questions so that we as a community of faith can be part of an answer that works, an effective answer that is right for our mission, our time, our place. And friends, this God of the universe who set the stars in motion is also the God of sleepless nights. And so those times of anguish or pain or regrets or failures that come to mind in those private moments, those questions are perfectly acceptable to God. In fact, I believe God waits for us to ask so that he can move and begin to fill us up with the love and the forgiveness and the hope that he has for us. And so I wanna to close today by just encouraging us to not be afraid to ask these questions because there is no place on our wilderness road, whether it be the wilderness road we are walking as a church or a community or a nation, or a wilderness road that we are experiencing in our personal life in some way. There is no place on a wilderness road that cannot become a holy place where new life springs forth. And so on this fifth Sunday in the season of Easter, let us say, Alleluia, Amen.